Bueno, buen día para Brasil, muy buenos días para el resto de la región de habla hispana. Eh, gostaria de, eh, primeiro, sejam bem-vindos todos, gostaria de agradecer pelo seu interesse em participar do webinar Empowering Engineering Research with Best Practices. Eh, vou estar falando uma mistura de português e espanhol para vocês ter a oportunidade de compreender a introdução. Um, vamos compartilhar hoje eh, melhores práticas eh, para vocês poder uh, desenvolver projetos de pesquisa em, em engenharia. Tá? Vamos a compartir hoje melhores práticas e alguns tips eh, com respeito a, eh, eh, a, eh, a melhores práticas justamente para desenvolver projetos de investigação em engenharia. Meu nome é Mariela López, eh, trabalho na Elsevier como responsável pelas soluções de engenharia e geociências, tenho base eh, no Rio de Janeiro, Brasil, mas trabalho para eh, América Latina. Me acompanha hoje Cristiane Fiorin, e a quem agradeço pela organização do seminário. Eh, ela também tem base, ela é gerente de marketing e tem base em Brasil e trabalha também para América Latina. Eh, vou... Eh, eh, acho que não precisa de tradução no espanhol essa introdução, eh, mas sim vou, vou compartilhar com vocês a estrutura do seminário. A apresentação principal, baseada na experiência dos palestrantes, uh, vai ser em inglês. Eh, depois da apresentação principal, vamos eh, compartilhar com vocês um questionário eh, anônimo e online que vou pedir para vocês se podem preencher. É importante eh, recolectar o feedback de vocês para... Eh, futuros eh, seminários. Eh, depois vamos abrir a perguntas e o que vou pedir para vocês é enviar essas perguntas eh, por Q&A. Vocês embaixo na tela tem chat e tem Q&A. Chat, como vocês estão interactuando agora, a gente pode ver todas, mas que seja interação, mas para a organização das perguntas é mais fácil para a gente trabalhar com as perguntas por Q&A. Eh, en español, entonces, importante sobre la estructura del seminario, rápidamente mencionarles que va a haber una presentación inicial, principal, va a ser en inglés, por el expertise de eh, Sally y de Matt, que ahora voy a presentar. Eh, después vamos a compartir con ustedes un cuestionario muy rápido, muy breve, eh, que es online y es anónimo y nos ayuda a nosotros en la organización de seminarios a futuro, de contenidos y demás. Eh, y después vamos a abrir a preguntas. Y lo que les solicité es que si pueden compartir esas preguntas por Q&A en vez del chat, nos facilita darle seguimiento. Y a todos vocês, importante también hablar que en el final de la sesión, vocês van a recibir un email con un mail enderezo. Caso fiquen preguntas sin responder eh, o cualquier otra que está, aunque vocês quieran dar continuidad, sí, va a tener la un mail enderezo y pueden me escribir y eh, voy a estar respondiendo. ¿Está bien? Entonces, al final van a recibir un email con un correo, con mi correo, donde cualquier pregunta que quedó pendiente o cualquier otra necesidad de información adicional pueden compartir conmigo. Dicho eso, said that, I will introduce Sally and Matt. Um, Sally, if you can move to the other slide where your name and, uh, is, uh, it should be great. Um, ah, ok, no problem. Eh, Sally and eh, Phil, eh, sorry, Sally Phil, eh, ella es eh, gerente de producto de la plataforma Engineering eh, Village. Ella tiene base en Dayton, eh, Estados Unidos. Y también Matt McGarva, eh, él es gerente de producto de contenido de la plataforma Engineering Village. Él tiene base en Londres, eh, eh, Inglaterra. Eh, entonces voy a dejar con él esa presentación y luego después voltamos con vosotros. Sally, es ahora all yours. Thank you, Mariella, for that uh, great introduction. 
During today's presentation, we will present a structured method for doing research. By the end of this session, it is our goal that you have the tools and processes for completing your research projects faster and with more comprehensive, incredible research. For those of you who want to publish your research, using the practices we recommend today will increase your chances of having your work reviewed and accepted for publishing. We walk through each step of the research process as well as discuss ways of storing and sharing your research for the future. So what you see in front of you is our agenda today. We would be walking through each one of these steps. Um, so by the end of today's webinar, um, you will have the tools and capabilities of being able to conduct research best practices. Next slide, please. So why implement research best practices? Well, the work that engineers do is exceedingly important. As engineering researchers, we know you want to continue advancing the field of engineering and building on previous successes. For this reason, making sure you're finding and using credible research will enable engineering advances and create new insights. In order for engineering breakthroughs to happen, research needs to be transparent and reproducible. That transparency may lead to faster and easier publishing. Finally, we have heard from both industry professionals and engineering faculty that engineers who can think critically and have high quality research skills are very much in demand. These are all great reasons for using best practice methods within your research processes. So we'll talk about working smarter, faster, and more efficiently, as well as the skill sets that you need to do research in a better way. Next slide. Decisions based on fac uh, faulty research findings can prove to be expensive or have serious safety flaws. Additionally, bad research can have a negative ripple effect on engineering research as the faulty information is further disseminated and other studies build on the false information. In order to determine if information is credible, the researcher needs to ask a series of questions and critically evaluate the content of any research report. So these types of questions, and it, it, we'll go into this a little bit more later, is, you know, is the research biased? Is the author reputable? Is the publisher reputable? How old is the information? And so forth. Um, there was a really great quote by, uh, a gentleman named Michael Rosenblatt from the Merck company who said on average it takes approximately two to six scientific personnel one to two years of work in an industry laboratory to reproduce the original investigations. Cost estimates of this are um, on average about 500,000 US dollars to 2 million US dollars. So um, making sure that your work is reproducible is important for scientific and engineering discoveries but also um, it can be very very expensive. So it's important to do it right, right out of the gate. Next slide. The word research could mean many things. Listed on the slide are most common types of research reviews done within the academic and corporate engineering research environments. A literature review is the most common type of research. It is a broad scan of published subject literature and evaluation of the most relevant research results. A literature review includes substantive findings, methodological and theoretical findings. Other types of reviews include scoping reviews, meta-analysis, um, systematic reviews. Those are all very important types of reviews, but today the type of review that we will focus on and the one that's done most is a literature review. Next slide. I mentioned earlier that we would be covering specific steps used in conducting best practice research. Each step builds on the previous step. By following this method, researchers will ensure their output uses credible resources, save time, have more comprehensive results, and in short, your research will be more successful. Um, so these steps that we'll be going through are choosing your topic and deciding the research question, um, which, you know, that it sounds like 
it's something that should be very easy, but my colleague Matt will go into this and all the things that you would want to think about in choosing your research topic. Next, you'll want to determine how broad or how narrow or the scope of your review and what it should be. Then select the resources that are most appropriate for your research. You'll want to finally conduct your research, which is uh, in essence finding the literature and managing the relevant items. And then finally review and analyze the literature. Next slide. Next slide. The best place for most researchers to start is with their own institution's library. Academic, corporate, and government institutions may have organizational-wide resources that can be used for engineering research. The online databases available are a great tool for locating journals, conferences, standards, dissertations, patents, and many other documents that engineers need to conduct high-quality research. Um, it, as a follow-up to this, um, and it is an example, you may want to use the CAPAS portal if you have access to that. If you do have access to the cable uh, CAPAS portal, um, you'll want to click on um, Buscar Base um, under Busca and then type Compendex um, and then click on the N NVR button to get to the Compendex database. Um, in today's uh, presentation, we'll be using some of the examples from that Compendex database. Next slide. There are differences in the in types of databases available for research. And for many of you, you have access to more than one type of engineering database. It's important to understand these differences so you are using the very best tool that will enable you to have um, faster um, uh, research as well as um, better success. Applying the right database will enable you to complete your research, um, too, with more complete results. The most common type of database contains text with information about a specific document. Text databases can include citation, abstract, or full text records. Additionally, each text record may have descriptive indexing terms applied to speed and enhanced discovery of topic records. My colleague Matt will talk more about the indexing in our next section. Um, so let's start with a citation database, which have records containing basic information about a document, including the document title, author, source, date published, publisher, and where to find the document, or um, something called the DOI, which I'll talk about later. Citation databases typically contain records from a wide array of publishers and from many different publication types, such as journals, conferences, and dissertations. This broad subject area coverage is what makes citation databases so useful. So in the um, example on the screen here, you just see um, uh, references to the literature. Um, and the advantage is that um, citation databases um, are what we call publisher agnostic. So you'll get information across a wide spectrum of topics as well as across a wide um, spectrum of different types of publications and, um, and from uh, types of uh, authors. Next slide. Next, an abstract or index, or what we call an ANI database, includes all of the citation record information you saw on the previous slide, along with a short summary of the article contents. By searching an ANI database, users can achieve highly relevant search results um, because the most important aspects of a document are typically described within the citation title or abstract. Like citation databases, ANI databases include a broad number of publishers and document types. Both citation and ANI databases may have links to the full text documents via an institution's electronic subscription or via the publisher's website. So with an ANI database, you get all the benefits of a citation database. Additionally, highly relevant search results because you're searching on the abstracts there. Next slide. 
And then finally, a full text database um, is a, a third type of text database. Um, they have uh, the full text of the document either um, in text format or in an image format, such as what you see on the screen here. Full text databases may include documents from a single publisher or licensed content from several publishers. Researchers like full text databases because they will, they will enable, be enabled to immediately access any relevant documents found within their search. Some of the disadvantages of full text is um, some of the publishers may be limited to a certain set of publishers or those where only the licensing can be obtained. Three other different types of databases are data or numerical map and video images. Um, what you see on the screen here is an example of a numerical database. It contains lots of pricing information for uh, crude oil. Um, and so these are very useful to get uh, um, data over a long period of time if you want to do some comparisons or analysis. Next slide. In a map database, um, that uh, what they include is not just the maps, um, but also um, descriptive information about those maps. Map databases have become more useful over the past 20 years as electronic location-based data is applied to maps, which can then be layered to determine new insights. As an example, you see here, we're using the GeoFacets database that enables researchers to find and extract maps, sections of maps, and other geographically referenced data for analysis. So um, combining um, text information with MAP is very useful, such as what you can find here in the GeoFacets database. And then our final database type includes video, film, or images. Each film or image um, can be retrieved using descriptive information or through captioning. In this example, users can search, view, and download video clips from the CNN uh, news database. So again, very useful to be able to enhance your research. Um, as mentioned earlier, choosing the right type of database for your research will enable you to better complete your research goals. This chart summarizes some of the key advantages and limitations of each type of database, and we will be posting this after the webinar for you to be able to reference um, going forward. As we introduce methods for engineering best practice, we will illustrate each step with examples. We're using the Engineering Village database platform to show example searches used during this presentation, yet much of what is discussed regarding databases can be applied to other database systems as well. The Engineering Village platform contains 14 different searchable databases, and in today's presentation, we'll use the Compendex database, which which covers over 190 different engineering disciplines and contains over 27 million records of published engineering literature. So in summary, um, what we've talked about in this first section is utilizing best practices, why it's important to use them, how they can um, speed your research, as well as make your research more successful, um, why it's important to make sure you're using credible resources and that the fact that reproducibility is important. Um, we'll talk about literature reviews and um, the steps to do those and, and that you, what you want to do as you're um, conducting your research is understand and choose the best database format that re suits your research needs. Um, we'll soon be going into topic development. Um, and so what I'd like to do now is turn it over to my colleague, Matt McGarva, who will walk through the first three steps of the literature review process, starting with topic development. Thank you, Sally. Hi, I'm Matt McGarva. I work alongside Sally uh, as a product manager on Engineering Village. And today I'll be taking you through the first three steps on the literature review uh, process. Yeah, as Sally mentioned, we'll start with uh, how to choose a topic and decide research questions. We'll then move on to determine the scope of the review uh, and then uh, move on finally before I pass back to Sally on how to select and um, 
evaluate sources. So let's get started with develop a topic. Developing a good research question can sometimes be the most difficult part of the research process. Uh, as an example, you may be assigned a broad topic for an assignment, and it may be up to you to find a, a subtopic within that research area. The thing to note is picking the topic is actually part of the research process. You can use the research you find to develop your knowledge and test your topic idea. It is also it is fine if your research that you find leads you away from your original topic idea. Even as you progress from this stage, you may find you need to return to the topic research cycle to further refine based on the research that you find. The cycle begins with the picking of a topic to test, then moves on to finding sources to read. You're then able to identify search terms and further refine your topic. So here I have a graphic that shows the three main questions you should ask yourself when starting. Um, topics you know on the left. Uh, it makes sense to stay in an area you already have some knowledge of. Uh, you don't need to know everything, but it helps if you're not starting from scratch. Ideally, it will also be a topic that interests you. That's the topics you love. If you choose a topic that interests you, you'll, it will hold your attention. The research will be more enjoyable. Finally, it must be a topic that others value and are interested in. This is the topics your audience cares about at the bottom. The sweet spot is a combination of all three in the middle, with topics you know and topics your audience cares about being the most important combination. So how did I get started with my search? I will now introduce the concept of professional indexing. Even if you're not aware of it, indexing powers not just the professional research databases we're introducing to you today, but it's also in many of the websites and services that you use every day. This example I have here is for Netflix. Netflix tag or index all of their shows and movies with a genre type. In fact, they have defined almost 80,000 of them. They precisely index each and every content type for their recommender system. This means if I watch a particular type of show or film, they're able to offer me similar content. This is to keep me interested in coming back, and consequently, of course, they help I continue to subscribe to Netflix. These categorizations are called, or genres uh, here, are called a controlled vocabulary. There are many different ways of describing concepts. Uh, drawing all of these terms together under a single word or phrase makes searching a database more efficient as it eliminates a lot of the guesswork. They are also organized in a hierarchy of broader and narrow terms, or parent and child terms, if you like. So we can see how a subject breaks down. This is um, organized in this fashion. This is called what we call a thesaurus or taxonomy that is used to index content, just like in the Netflix example. Here I'm showing a slide that you can see how it works in a research database setting. I'm showing the thesaurus structure for electric motors. I can see in the hierarchy it's broader or parent term is motors and its narrow or child terms of a different type of electric motors available. In the structure, I can also see related concepts to electric motors, such as electric drives. This is uh, very useful if I'm searching in a new subject area. I can use the thesaurus structure, and I can quickly see how a subject breaks down into its more specific or narrower terms, and also how it relates to other subjects. So this can be very good way to start if you're in a new subject area you can see where a concept sits in relation to other concepts. To give a sample of how things can be referred to, um, it's a simple example of how things can be referred to in different ways, here are three different ways of writing stepping motors with step, stepper and stepping all frequently used by the authors. The control vocabulary indexes all of these variants with one standardized control term, stepping motors. This means you only need to search in this one control term to retrieve all of the results, ensuring nothing is missed out of your search. 
Within an indexed research database, such as Engineering Village, these terms are added to all of the articles to, search, to aid search and discovery. Each article is tagged with all of the control terms to summarize the subjects it focuses on. So to summarize that, searching uh, first step. So searching with a new subject area is very difficult to start with. Uh, you can use the professional index databases you have available in the library that will help guide you through the process. A controlled vocabulary is uh, essentially a standardized subject heading, heading used by catalogers and database indexes to describe what a source, uh, article or book in this example is actually about. You can use the control vocabulary to show you how subjects are defined hierarchically and related to each other to learn about a new subject area. So now I'm ready to move on to my next step, which is to determine the scope of the review. I'm now ready to pick and test my topic, and I'm interested in researching smart speakers as part of the research project for artificial intelligence. I have searched for the phrase smart speakers and only retrieved 85 results. Possibly there is not enough information and I've chosen a topic that is maybe too specific or narrow to start with. When picking a topic, be careful of hot topics in the media. Some are new or not have sufficient background research. A is, uh, AI is a hot topic at the moment and might appear to be new, but it's actually a very old topic. It was introduced as a control term into our thesaurus in 1986. Knowing my search for AI using an index database on Engineering Village is a great method, so I've always skipped forward there. So, sorry, here I've broadened my initial smart speaker search to the more general subjects of artificial intelligence. Because each article is indexed with the control vocabulary terms, I can use the indexing to get an overview of all the topics contained within my results. I could use this information to narrow my search to the use of, say, AI in the classification of information, or perhaps uh, the use of AI within medical imaging. So narrowing my search uh, using the indexing is a great method I'm actually going to return to my initial smart speaker search to demonstrate search strategies. Is there really a small amount of research on my topic or is my search somehow deficient? Control for Calibri is not a replacement for keyword search. They're complementary search tools and are very powerful when used together. In my search, my initial search for smart speakers, I only had 85 results. But even in this small result set, I can find good keywords that will, can potentially unlock my search. Here, just looking at the titles, I can see keywords such as loudspeaker, speech, microphones, and voice. Here, I'm going to collect my keywords to build my search strategy. Keywords can be found from both the search results and using the professionally created taxonomies that have synonyms and narrower more specific and related concepts. I'm going to organize my keywords into two buckets essentially for each of the two aspects I'm trying to find. I'm interested in the smart speaker, so on the left I've put together my smart and artificial intelligence terms using the thesaurus structure, and on the right I've put together my speech, voice and speaker related terms uh, that I found in my 85 results. So this is going to be my search strategy or search string. I'm going to search for my artificial, artificial intelligence and smart keywords that must appear in articles along with my speech and speaker keywords. I combine the terms in each of my buckets using what we call a Boolean OR. Uh, this means how it reads. So in the left bucket, it'll be AI or artificial intelligence or smart, etc. on the left hand side. I'm going to and, use a Boolean and these together with my speech or speaker terms on the right. So my results will have one or more of the terms on the left as well as one or more of the terms on the right. 
Here is how I enter that search into Engineering Village. Uh, when I first come into Quick Search, I'll just see a simple search box and look to Google. To expand that into my two buckets, I can click on, just underneath, I can click on Add a Search Field. I can now enter my AI and speaker keywords all together and combine the two buckets with an AND on the left-hand side. Let's have a look at the results of that search strategy. My results have gone up from just 85 for the smart speaker to over 50,000. My results also look good, containing two of my aspects, voice and speech, combined with artificial intelligence and learning. There's a lot of actual research for smart speakers. It was just that my initial search for smart speakers was not very good because I just used a single, very specific phrase. Now I've found a quite a large body of research, I can develop my research questions. I start by writing down what I already know and don't know about my topic. For example, I may not know exactly how smart speakers work or what people use them for, or perhaps the development trends, or maybe the social implications concerning privacy and security. This allows me to formulate my possible research questions. Uh, those could be, what are the enabling technologies? What are the main applications for use? Or what has been the trend in research in the last five years, say? Uh, or even what steps have been taken to ensure privacy and security. You may think you've discovered a new and exciting research question only to find that it's already been answered. With pressure to add new knowledge to the field, we need to learn how to identify research gaps in existing literature. A research gap is simply a topic or area with missing or insufficient information or perhaps using the information available, it's not possible to reach a conclusion for a given question. Here I've limited my 50,000 results to security and privacy, which is a smaller, potentially gap area I might be able to add value to. So to summarize, it's fine if the research you find leads you away from your original topic idea, it's best practice to identify search terms using a control vocabulary with a professional database. And where possible, try to identify research gaps to ensure you're adding new knowledge to your field. I'm now ready to move on to my final step of selecting resources. Engineer Village is a platform that has multiple databases available. We hear from faculty that a mix of content aids students' understanding of a subject, uh, contributes to better quality assignments and also grades, and allows for more general, thorough review of existing literature and research findings. In Compendex and in academic publishing in general, most of the content is published as either an academic journal or a conference proceeding. We also have books, engineering standards, trade journals, and dissertations to broaden the content mix. One of the main questions we get asked is, what actually is the difference between a conference and a journal publication? Conference cycles offer faster feedback and they tend to present a work in progress. They're geared towards uh, peer interaction and have a lower impact factor than journals. They tend to present new concepts and techniques that you're in the process of developing. Journal publications take longer to be published and hence the feedback received is slower. They, they present completed work and, and have a rigorous peer review. Consequently, they have a higher impact factor. Journal articles report on new concepts and techniques that have been validated by experiments. Conferences are increasingly used as an important channel for scholarly communication in engineering, and particularly we see for computer science. Books are designed for foundational and historical content. Books are able to synthesize knowledge from many studies to present a more complete picture of a research area. Uh, for my, just going back to my smart speaker search, you can see 
which is a computer science subject, you can see the, doc the most dominant document type are actually conference articles, not journals. Standards are codes of best practice containing technical specifications and guidelines. Technical standards are materials that uh, students should learn to prepare them for industry. It teaches students to ask which safety or compatibility standards are applicable to my design project, for example. Patents, um, which describe new inventions, are another great resource for technical information. Here again, I've run my smart speaker search uh, strategy across both the Compendex databases and also the patent databases on Engineering Village. I can see a significant amount, almost 40% of my results are actually contained in patents and not academic literature. Patents can also show which companies are active in a given subject. Uh, for smart speakers, I can see that IBM and Google are very active in this area, for example. Dissertations can also be a great source of information uh, and they're very good for surfacing original research. They also have extensive bibliography that could highlight sources that would otherwise be missed in a, in a general search. So to, to summarize, a mix of uh, content, age, or understanding of a subject and contributes to both quality assignments and grades. Uh, you can use a professional AI discovery database we can search all different content types together all in one place. I'd now like to pass you back to my colleague Sally who will take you through the final two steps of the literature review process. Thank Thanks you. Matt. Thanks Matt. Um, so I'll take a look at uh, step four which is actually conducting your research. Matt has walked you through choosing the topic, you know, deciding how um, narrow or broad you want to make your research as well as selecting your researcher. So now that you've done all of that, it's time to actually conduct your research. Next slide and next slide. So now that you've selected your topic and the type of databases you want to search, um, we'll, you want to actually use the databases um, to conduct your research um, on a topic of great interest to you. Most of you have probably entered a, a search into Google search box um, and have found that if you enter your search with some quotes around it, it will search all of your terms together as a single phrase. Um, this technique also works well in many other databases as well. So some of the um, knowledge that you have in searching Google, you can apply to um, the research databases or the subscription databases that you have within your library. Um, one of the most common search techniques is to use what are called Boolean search statements. And Matt alluded to these earlier in our presentation. If you ever took a logic class, the Boolean logic will look very familiar to you. Boolean statements are a way to narrow or broaden the information that you want or exclude records that are not relevant to you. So um, on the example I have here on the screen, I've got um, the three main Boolean operators, which are and, or, or not. And it's a little counterintuitive, but if you use an and operator, such as searching hydrodynamics and acoustics, um, you'll actually narrow your search. So you will only get documents that include those two terms. Um, and if you want to broaden your search, instead use an OR operator. And in this example, um, I've used bubble OR plasma so that my search will include all documents that have a word bubble or all documents that were, have a word plasma and certainly those that have overlapping of those two terms. And then finally, using a not operator will exclude some terms. So in this case, I have solar not vehicle. Um, and in this case, I would find um, solar, I, I would not find solar vehicles. So that body of research would be excluded. Very handy um, if you want to do more precise searching. Next slide. 
So once you get familiar with simple Boolean statements, you can combine them into some very powerful searches. Um, if you think back on your first algebra class uh, where you learned to put parentheses about, around parts of the equation that you wanted to do first, um, those that same concept can be used with the Boolean statements. Um, in the example above, the words bubble or plasma will be combined with display so that the search results will come contain both bubble displays as well as plasma displays. There's something called truncation, which again, many of you have probably used in your Google searches. <clears throat> and truncation will substitute any number of characters. In the example above, the search engine will find the words computers, computing, computation, etc. Um, it's useful for also finding different spelling variations such as sulfate and sulfate with a PH versus an F. A wild card is a little different from truncation. It will substitute a, diff a single character, which is also good for spelling variations. So in this case, I um, uh, have the British um, or American spelling of color or gray. Finally, a proximity search, you can specify how far apart your search terms are from each other. In the example, solar near uh, within one word of energy, you would retrieve solar energy as well as solar powered energy and solar generated energy. Each database has specific ways to conduct your Boolean searches, so it's useful to know the searching parameters for the database you're using. Additionally, the database interface may have tools to help you construct your searches. So being aware and understanding how these databases work and how they put your searches together is very useful and will help you speed your research and get better results. Next slide. One of the most common mistakes in conducting database searches is to type too many terms and the result tends to be zero. To start, it is better to search each of your concepts separately. Um, Matt gave you a great example of this earlier. He separated out the different um, types of components to doing his smart speaker search. Um, in the previous example, you, um, you searched uh, for artificial intelligence and then voice activated speakers. Both can be searched as separate terms and then combined to get more relevant results. Another tip is to use variations in the same term or name. In the example here, Tim Berners Lee, who's widely accredited with establishing the parameters for the internet, he's published uh, documents with each of the named variations shown. By using an author index available in some databases, you may be able to complete a comprehensive search for an author. Otherwise, you'll need to do name variation searching. Also, researchers around the world may use spelling variations, so you want to consider those as well. Finally, most databases will enable you to save your searches so you can come back to them at a later date and build on your search. So these are all good search strategies and things that you'll want to consider as you're doing your research. So I'd like to take a moment here to talk about um, something I mentioned earlier called a DOI. Um, and these are links to full text documents that you'll find within some records. Within the full text, the documents are typically available via PDF link or text. If you're using a citation or an abstract and index database, there may be links that you can use to connect to those full text documents. The linking happens through the use of something called a digital object identifier or a DOI. A DOI is a document code that we can use to locate a document on the web. Each DOI is unique to a single document. It's um, sort of like a unique number for it. When you are reviewing records, look for the DOI links to get to the full text documents. You may also need to keep a list of those DOIs within your bibliography or your citations in order to um, help others reproduce your research at a later date. So as you're doing your research, you know, look through the records and see if there's a DOI there. 
Another important document category is open access. Some documents are published without subscription or payment options for readers. Within Engineering Village and Compendix, it's possible to narrow your search to open access documents via FACET. This is really handy search strategy if you quickly need a just a few full text documents and are concerned about doing a comprehensive search. So if you're doing best practice research and you want to do a comprehensive search and that's your goal, um, then you'll need to have both um, published literature as well as published literature that has been um, tagged as open access. So being aware of this and how to get to the document and how it's published is important um, for you in order to be able to communicate your research results and have that reproducibility. So in summary, um, a comprehensive literature search is an iterative process um, using that Boolean logic um, and creating search statements and then narrowing it from um, a very broad start is a good place um, for you to begin your research. And then um, knowing how to get to full text documents anywhere on the web using DOIs and open access can uh, enable you to quickly find your full text documents. And our final step here in um, our literature review steps are to review and analyze the literature. So starting with credible research is important. Researchers need to stop and review search results at various points during the research process to determine if information is valid reputable and free of errors. One of the best known methods for analyzing research is the CRAAP test or CRAAP test. The CRAAP reviews the currency, relevancy, authority, accuracy, and purpose of a document. By asking questions such as, was the information published in a peer-reviewed journal? Or does the document present well-balanced and independent research? Um, through asking these questions, researchers can increase the quality of their research and weed out studies that may have questionable research methods or conclusions. It's so very easy to disseminate information now on the web that um, information that may have may not have been reviewed, peer-reviewed, or that may not be credible is very easily available. Um, so for these reasons, it's important to stop, ask the questions that you see here uh, within the CRAAP review um, to critically evaluate the information that you're using. Again, we will be making this information available to you after this webinar, so you'll be able to um, print this, hang it on your office wall um, and come back to it if needed. So when you're analyzing information, um, other factors to consider are the possible bias of the author or sponsoring organization. Um, if, uh, studies may be funded by an organization that may have um, a purpose or want to see the outcomes um, come out in a favorable way to that organization. So it's important to be to understand who's funding uh, the research and uh, what bias they may have. Um, also, gaps in the research um, uh, need to be looked at, as well as the research methods used. Um, gaps in the research aren't necessarily a bad thing. Um, as we talked about earlier, you may want to see gaps in the research so that um, you can um, look to those gaps and actually conduct the research yourself to fill in that knowledge or those gaps within um, engineering literature. If your goal is comprehensive research on a specific topic, then it's important to ask where there may be those gaps. Having gaps within a, um, a research actually could be a good thing. Next slide. 
So one of the questions um, that we get asked is, how do you know when you're done with your research? Um, and you'll know that you are um, nearing um, being thorough or comprehensive with your research is when you begin to see the same key authors and seminal documents appear within your research results. It's also to, important to ask the question, have you answered the question that you started or sought um, to seek answers for? So when Matt talked about earlier the, you know, choosing your topic and just, you know, going through doing your initial literature review and determining if indeed that's the topic you want for your research and then determining your research question. Well, this is at this point after you've completed your search and evaluated the credibility of your information that you want to ask that question. Have you actually answered the question you sought? In some cases, you may be done with your initial research, but you may want to stay up to date on a topic. So you will need to create something called alerts. Most databases have some sort of feature for that. Um, by using alerts, basically what happens is it saves your search and then a list of new records or documents that are matching your search. Anytime those are added to a database, you will get an email containing a list of those documents. Very handy if it's something where you're doing a research project over a long period of time or you want to stay up to date or as an authority on a particular topic. So regarding our agenda, um, we're fine at the end here. Um, I want to conclude by talking about storing and sharing your research. And really, while this is not part of the the five steps of doing a literature review, it is something that you want to think about as you begin your research projects. So even before you begin your research project, it's important to consider how you want to manage your research output. Do you need to document your search strategies for reproducibility later so that others can use those same search strategies? Um, does your institution have common storage area for research data or output? Are there standards within your institution for storage file formats? If you will be storing and tracking document citations, um, are there several citation management programs that are available for free or a small fee? Your organization um, may also want you to use a specific type of citation management software such as Mendeley. Um, Mendeley is a, a, a way to be able to manage your research um, and it's freely available from Elsevier and download. There's others also out there, um, but certainly uh, check with your organization, see how they want you to manage research, and also think about how you may want to share that research with others. So that concludes um, our research best practices. Next slide, please. Um, we have a few moments for questions. There is a Q&A um, aspect of our Zoom meeting. We encourage you to click on that Q&A and ask questions that you may have. Yes, Salith and Matt, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, Chris, I think you are going to launch the, the questions, right? Yes. So, ten lana tela, ten más preguntas que yo falé al principio, inicio de un seminario para vocês responder. Por en cuanto eh, Sally y Matt eh, van a estar oleando las preguntas que vocês ya enviaron por Q&A. Temos a, a, a alguns minutos ainda, mas caso vocês precisem ir embora e fique alguma questão, eh, como falei, podemos responder pelo correo. Matt, Sally, they are going to respond uh, the, these questions. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to review the questions that they already sent through Q&A. Mari, um, perdón, te sugiero que, que haga las preguntas a ellos, tal vez. Okay. 
Um, while they're answering that question, I can go through some of the Q&A. Um, one of the first questions here is, which software do you recommend to add references to our thesis reports, articles, and is it free? There are some free reference management um, software out there. Um, what you'll find in data, it's important to check with your organization. So that would be your first step. Is there a recommended reference management you know, software program used within your organization. Um, once you find that out, um, when you are downloading information um, or printing information from a database search, chances are that there's um, a format that you can use within the database. So um, I'm using Compendex today because, you know, that's the one that we're using this example. But again, lots of databases have this feature. Um, in Compendex, when you download, you have a menu of um, options that you can download to specific um, reference management software. So some of the popular ones are RefWorks, EndNote. Um, you can do some agnostic um, citation formats that can be imported into any reference management uh, program. So, um, again, important to check with your organization, what do they use, and then when you're downloading information, look for those reference management um, formats. So the next question is, um, let's see here, um, is it possible to see which journals are part of Engineering Village? If so, could you please show us how to do this. Um, Matt, um, that's one for you. And um, I, I believe checking with the librarians in their organization is a good place to start. Is that correct? That's right. That's a good place to start. Also, we publish um, actually um, a list of all the source titles that we take onto the database. Um, after the meeting, I can, I can send a link to that as well. OK, great. Uh, another question, Matt, um, is, is, well, is what is the difference between a conference article and a conference proceeding? Well, that's a good one. Yeah, sorry, I think I use them interchangeably, but yeah, conference proceeding is basically, I have to visualize it, so a conference proceeding is say like a book and each of the articles or the chapters inside. So a conference proceeding is just like the whole thing and all of the different uh, articles within uh, referred to as the conference articles. So I think I explained that a bit confusingly. Thanks, Matt. So um, one of uh, two more questions here. We, I'm, we don't have time for all of them, and but we are tracking the questions. Um, so what we will do is try and get back to you if we don't answer them live here. Um, so this question is, how can I combine systematic review and bibliometric research? I mean, could I collect some data like numbers of articles, origins, publishers, and period published during the second and third steps? Um, you know, uh, the first few steps are more in the preparation of the research. Um, certainly, as you are doing your research um, based on your um, the question that you're asking, you want to use many different types of information. Um, and then uh, as that question that, that we talked about earlier, understanding the output and how you want to uh, manage your output is really one of the first things you want to do before you do your research. So you're understanding your question, your topic, and so forth, the types of resources that you use. Um, if you want to manage your data and be crunching data, and um, maybe it's a time series, maybe you're looking at uh, data um, as outcome from experience, as well as combining that with your literature research, absolutely. Um, you'll want to manage that in some sort of reference management program. There's lots of them out there, um, both free and subscription-based. Again, check back with your organization. Um, the last question I have here is Compendex and Engineering Village available via the CAPIS website? And the answer is yes. Um, Mariella and Christian, um, maybe you can talk a little bit more to that. 
Yes, definitely. Uh, this is one of the platforms available uh, through CAPES uh, to all the institutions in, in Brazil that are part of the portal Periodicos. So the access there, uh, we are going to share information uh, with the ones who joined, uh, facilitating this information to all of you. Great. Thanks, Mariella. And, uh, thank you uh, for attending our presentation today. Um, we will be sending some follow-up material, as Mariella mentioned. Obrigada a todos por su participación. Vamos a continuar en contacto. Obrigada también. Gracias a todos también por responder la encuesta online. Como dije, eso es importante para nosotros y continuaremos en contacto. Thank you, Sally and Matt. Thank, no, you. thank you. Bye. Adiós. Bye. -bye. Todos un buen día. Chao. Obrigada a todos. Buen día. Gracias.